Boy and Quill John. Guys, welcome back. We have James Nestor, author of Breath, the, the New Science of a Lost Art. What James does is tell you that basically you think you know how to breathe, you think you know how to live, but you don't. And he's going to explain why. So James, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm great. I am great. This is a uh, interview that we've been trying to set up for quite some time. And uh, it's pretty interesting given that all of the things that I do now over the course of these years, breath work and stuff like that has become a big part of my training which sounds insane for the most part for most people uh, involved in sports and especially in professional sports because no one teaches you anything about it. No one talks about it at all. So I'd like to go ahead and just get us going with the start. How did you get into this? Um, how did you figure out this was something useful for us? You just kind of get us to that story and then we can go. Yeah, I was there. pretty shocked that no one was really talking about breathing and athletic performance or sickness or snoring or, or any of that early on. This was years and years ago. And then I met some free divers. These are people who do something that's supposed to be scientifically impossible. They can hold their breath for six or seven minutes at a time. They can dive down to depths of 300 and 400 feet. And they were the ones who really showed me the potential of breathing, not only for diving and holding your breath, but how to breathe to heat yourself up and to heal yourself and to uh, perform better and recover quicker. And they said it was no mystery. We get most of our energy from, from air, not, not from food. And how we get that energy is it depends on, you know, it, it influences us on so many different levels. So it all made sense to me. I had just never heard about it before. Totally. Yeah, that's the same. That's the same boat that I'm in now. And I kind of was really interested when you actually wrote. What I like is that number one, I didn't know that you learned or taught yourself how to free dive. So, yeah, that's. Can we? I have no idea how or why you decided that that would be fun. It yeah, looks scary. In my you opinion, know, the but. free diving a lot of us see is competitive diving. That's the only stuff that makes it into the news media is these people challenging one another to see how deep they can dive and basically come back to the surface alive. If that sounds dangerous and stupid, it's because I think it, it is. So they've taken something that is an underwater meditation, this, this beautiful thing, and turned it into a competition. To be clear, if people want to compete and do this, that's totally cool. I have no, no problem with that at all. I, the problem I, I do have is that that is what we understand of free diving. People think about free diving and they, they immediately get scared and they said, oh, this is some daredevil thing like base jumping. It's not. Our bodies are designed to do this. So once I got to really meet and understand what free diving was about from a bunch of experts in the field, they finally took me, took me under and said, hey, if you're going to write about this stuff, you have to learn how to do it. And this doesn't mean I was diving down to 300 feet, you know, and, and coming back half dead. It meant going down to maybe 15 feet and the next day, maybe 30 feet. And to understand how your body operates in the ocean, to understand what it's like to be in the ocean, be totally silent, have all this oceanic life come and surround you and welcome you into it. And so that that's what free diving is for me. And I, I just think it's a pity that so many people associate it with this daredevil activity. Yeah. When I've seen it, it's been sensationalized, obviously. And the first thing that they generally will talk about is how someone died, unfortunately. Uh, and I know it's happened on a number of cases in, and, and that's what they, they, that's not necessarily what gets glorified, but that's definitely what gets picked out. But I'm, I'm definitely curious, given that the, a whole host of the people that are going to be listening to this are involved in sport and majority soccer players or footballers. Um, what did you and have you found anything in the athletic world for a structure or a basis for this? Because I personally have not. And if you haven't, or like if you've spoken with any teams, any coaches, any trainers who are just doing some crazy breath stuff that you maybe ran across in your research... If you haven't run across that, is there anything that you could kind of lay out as a very small foundational basis for someone to want to get better at? And what are the benefits? Like, why should I even care? I think that's probably what people may have been looking at, you know, at first, 
when I looked at the book, it's like I had, I had an understanding of some previous un, uh, uh, like Tumo and uh, you know Wim Hof has become rather uh, you know popular now. I knew about him way back in like 2012 or 13. I read some random book on it and kind of started with it. So that would be my question, essentially. What have you found in the sports world that's that's given you you know any hope for this what, taken seriously? What I discovered is that coaches have been using breath training for decades and decades and decades, and it worked incredibly well for so long. Uh, some runners, uh, coaches would have the runners carry water in their mouths. They'd have them uh, take a cup of water, put it in their mouths, run around the track, come back and spit the water back out. What does that force you to do? It forces you to breathe through your nose because when you're breathing through your nose, you get 20% more oxygen. And by getting 20% more oxygen, you don't, you know, you think that's not going to make a difference to your performance and, and recovery. You're, you're crazy. And so this guy, Carl Stow taught runners. Uh, he taught opera singers. He taught emphysemics how to breathe better. And he was the one that was brought in for the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, elevation 6,000 feet. And he's the one who taught the U.S. men's uh, track and field team to, to breathe properly. And they went out and destroyed everybody. They won more, more medals than any other track team ever. And they did not need to take oxygen before or after the races. Every other team was. They didn't need to because they knew how to breathe properly. Mm. So he trained numerous professional athletes. And I'm in touch with several elite trainers right now for NBA, NFL, cyclists, runners, football stars. And mark my words, in about five years, this stuff is going to be taught hand in hand with, with weight training. Because we have 11 pounds of muscles that control our respiration, right? We're working out every other muscle in our body, our wrists, our arms, but we're not working out the muscle that delivers us energy, <laughs> which is absolutely nuts. And you'll be shocked when you start looking at the scientific research at the performance gains that people can get after four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, uh, double digit performance gains. And uh, it's all right there in the literature, but for some reason, you know, we're focused on developing new goos or new powders to, to eat be, before you compete, uh, which is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you say those gains that they're getting, these massive gains, what are they doing mm -hmm. specifically? What specifically? Because you mentioned mouth breathing, and I know, obviously, having read the book, and now I do remember the anecdote of the, the track, uh, the guys putting the, you know, the water in their mouth. But when you mention that they're having these gains, what specifically are they, are they only just deciding, I just breathe through my nose? Are they not doing any other exercise? They're, besides they're that? developing their diaphragmatic movement. So a lot of us, when we get stressed or when we enter into like zone four, zone five, like really intense exercise, we tend to default to the mouth. <sighs> so when you're breathing this way, you just think about the body's physiology, right? When you're breathing that quickly and, and that shallow, you are bringing air into your mouth, to your throat, to the bronchi, just to the very top of the lungs that only plays, it's very hard to get oxygen at the top of our lungs. So it doesn't participate in gas exchange as efficiently as the lower lungs. So you're literally just bringing air in and whew, exhaling it. It's like sitting at a stop sign and just idling your car, right? You're not going anywhere with that. So what all of these trainers are doing is teaching athletes how to breathe in line with their metabolic needs. Yes, when you're in an all-out sprint, you have to go for it. It's fine to open your mouth for moments at a time, but you want to be breathing efficiently. Why would you want to be expending energy you wouldn't need to expend? You know, especially if you're a professional athlete, you need to be operating in, in the zone of complete efficiency so that you can have energy to run faster than your opponent, to run harder and to run longer. And that's exactly what breath training really does. So I have a, a very interesting question. Have you seen some of these new, there's a lot of uh, products on the market now. A lot of them contact us. Uh, with hopes that we'll, you know, promote them in certain stuff, and it's it's been funny because I had a obviously before having read your book, I had a different take on those because you think as an athlete, you take air in, you take air out. What is it like? Uh, if I just if I just do that when I need air, I'm getting more air. I thought that was what it was. No one told me otherwise. <laughs> so, you know, uh, go well, ahead, it's go ahead. it's like say? food. 
You know, it's not just about eating food. You don't just eat food or not eat food. It's what food you eat. (laughs) And breathing, breathing is the same thing. It's, it's how you're taking in that air just really will influence your performance and how your body operates. Because of course it does. Every cell, you know, is going to be working uh, aerobically. It wants to work aerobically. You can switch to anaerobic and that's fine, but it's going to wear your body down if you're anaerobic for, for too long. So you want to be using oxygen. So if you want to be using oxygen, you want to be getting that oxygen in an efficient way. And that's what this breath training Mm -hmm. is doing. And that's what some of those products are trying to train you to do, to breathe slower, to breathe deeper, to breathe less than you're used to, because you actually get more oxygen, more energy by breathing that way. It's so counterintuitive, but that's how the body works even with the ones that have you breathing through the mouth, because that's actually what I was going to yeah. refer to. So even with those, it's, it's, it's beneficial. It's not just because I, I thought that the, the idea or the case was, I mean, I know that these masks at the very initial time had some issues calling yeah. themselves elevation masks or something like this. They're, uh, they're you know. not, they're not simulating elevation. And, and I don't know why they call it altitude mass or, or whatever. They're not right, simulating right. being in an atmosphere where oxygen molecules are further apart, which is what it is in, in at altitude. Okay. What they're doing is acclimating you to higher levels of carbon dioxide and they're working out the diaphragm. It's harder to breathe in those things, right? <laughs> So that will work out the diaphragm, this huge umbrella-shaped muscle that controls how the lungs inflate and deflate. So that's where they're helpful. And they are helpful. They, they really work. Um, and, and I know a bunch of people who have gotten uh, pronounced benefits from it. But to me, it really starts with nasal breathing, seeing what your natural body can do. It's not a coincidence in yoga. So many breaths are, are called unjai breaths, right? you create this resistance in your throat. What that's doing is basically an altitude training mask. You know, you, you can do this with the technology you're born with. Those masks totally work. I've used them before. I thought they were interesting, but you know, I, I kind of prefer my own, my own lips and nose, but, but that's just me. I'm not bagging on them. People can use them if they want, but they're essentially doing the same thing. Your own self-conditioning will be doing the same as so many of these products. That's yeah. I, that's what I've noticed uh, as well. I would say I definitely tried the mask. I think it's cool. It clearly restricts a certain, I mean, you, you're, you're struggling if you put it at the, the strongest level for air training like that, and then taking the mask off and then running. It's like, I see, I, I understand what's going on here, but I would say I, I'm a little interested also as well, because pranayama is part of my breath routine. Um, alternate nose breathing for, you know, I mean, I know that there's all sorts of layers of pranayama and I mean, it goes, it's just essentially infinite, but essentially alternate nose breathing. And what I thought was interesting, I'd love to hear what you found from that. And I know there's been some great research into that, but, uh, when I'm looking to develop as an athlete, uh, and I'm looking at like trying to speak to these guys about why it's important and why they should maybe try and give the, give, give this a go. There's so much out there for them to dig through, uh, there are different benefits to different breathing practices though. No, I mean, it seems as if maybe what you're training for as a free diver is different than what someone who's just sitting and, you know, holding. Yeah, breath. that's, that's exactly right. And I heard this from a free diver early on. She said, there are as many ways to breathe as there are foods to eat. And just as you would eat certain foods to allow your body to better perform at different levels, you would breathe in different ways. So there's no blanket prescription for everybody. And that's what was so confusing when I was first researching this book. You know, I was buying these pranayama books, 400 different methods. They all have these crazy names. I'm like, cool, where do I start? What what do I do? So I tried to focus in the book. It's, It's, you know, the center of the book is like, okay. Here's how you should breathe if you're an asthmatic, if you're an ultra marathoner, if you're a cyclist, whatever. Everyone's going to benefit from breathing through the nose. It doesn't need to be all the time. I'm talking about habitual breathing needs to be through the nose. And especially for aerobic training, for running, nasal breathing is so far superior for so many reasons. We can get into that later. Another thing you need to do is to breathe deeply. Deep doesn't need to be big. It's not like... (gasps) 
When you breathe through the nose, the nose is this natural buffer, so it slows down the air. There's your altitude training mask, right? This naturally slows down the air, and it makes it harder to exhale that air. That's good. That allows your your lungs more time to extract more oxygen. So that's why we have this thing, and that's why our nose is filled with all these different structures. Our mouths aren't. I can take a huge breath like that. That doesn't mean it's good. That doesn't mean it's a, it's efficient. I can use my mouth in an emergency if I get popped in the face or if I can't use my nose, but that doesn't mean I should be mouth breathing. And there's so much science supporting that, you know. So after you've gotten that that nasal breathing and you're breathing slowly and deeply, you can start to focus on breathing less. And this is something I've seen with so many athletes is they do interval training by forcing them to breathe less during these these uh, different activities. By doing this, you acclimate your body to accept more CO2, which brings more circulation to your body, which brings more oxygen. So right now, if you were to like exhale and hold your breath, after a few seconds, you're going to feel this need to breathe. That's dictated by CO2, not oxygen. People say, I'm out of breath. I'm not, I don't have enough oxygen. That's CO2 levels. And the more tolerant you are for higher CO2 levels, the better you're going to be able to perform, at least in, in many cases. And we've seen that with top tier athletes can withstand a lot of CO2. They're comfortable with it, which allows that circulation to be so much more vigorous throughout their bodies. Uh, that was one of the most fascinating things to see in the in the book. And if I'm remembering it right, yeah, you <clears throat> you took a, there was some mask or did you take CO2? I, I did it I all. Remember, and it's there, yeah, <laughs> did it all. So yeah. I, I was using yeah. a resistance yeah. trainer while jogging in this park and try to trying to do this with with this guy Anders Olsen, who's a breathing therapist. He's worked with Olympians. He's worked with asthmatics, and it's basically like an altitude mask. So it inhibits your your uh, airflow, and it is through the mouth, which is fine because this is just a practice. It's a technique, totally fine to do. But it, it forces you to increase your CO2. And the more, again, the more acclimated you get to that CO2, the more you're going to be able to be more flexible in situations. Like you don't want to be at the sideline. That's you don't want. I mean, you know this more more than you want to be calm in control. You want to have energy. You want to be ready to roll. And that's what all these different practices allow you to do. Brian McKenzie and Laird Hamilton, they've been onto this stuff for years, and they're dealing with top-tier athletes. And the number one thing they start with is they look at their breathing and they fix that. And that's one of the most incredible things that I think as well that I saw in the book is the fact that people are going to have a hard time believing that a lot of the ailments that they have can be fixed just by fixing the way that they breathe. It seems so ridiculous that it could be that simple to fix what, what asthma and I don't even know how many other ailments that, that, that are there that just you know are spurred up while we tr- try and put Band-Aids on top of them all, all the while if we could just simply fix the breath you know, it, it would, it would go away. So uh, maybe you could just touch on a little bit, all of the, all of the different things that come up from people breathing wrong and that were fixed, because I know you once again, which I love that you, that you do, that you're very hands-on in the way that you learn and, 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 and write and things. You plugged up your nose for, uh, a bit. And I, I'm, t- I cannot believe you volunteered for that. That isn't, I would never, volunteer to do that for how long? Seven days or? 10 days. Yeah. 10 days. So yeah, the, no, there's, <laughs> there's no blanket prescription for everyone. So I don't want to be here and, and say anyone with asthma, you just need to fix your breathing. Anyone with emphysema just need to fix your breathing. So I, w- I would never say sure, that. Sure. Uh, what we can do is look at the scientific literature and look at these populations who have panic syndrome who have anxiety, who have asthma, who have COPD, uh, who have heart issues, who have autoimmune issues. And, and, you know, time and time again, so many of these people who adopt healthy breathing habits can either blunt the symptoms or in some extraordinary cases, reverse their diseases, reverse incurable diseases. And 
uh, asthma especially. You think about an asthmatic as a population, they tend to breathe way too much. They tend to breathe through their mouths. And what happens when they think they're going to have an asthma attack? <sighs> and so what happens to the body the more that you breathe? You offload that CO2, you cause all this constriction, and you throw yourself into an attack. So there are so many studies looking at having asthmatics control their breath, get their CO2 up, calm themselves when they feel an attack coming on instead of going, I can't breathe, slow it down, hold your breath for a couple seconds, breathe in a rhythmic pattern and voila, who would have guessed, <laughs> you know, the attack is the subsides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, to me, the, this is not complicated. It's And that's what so much of the stuff was like, well, of course that makes sense. Like emphysemics, if you see these people, it's so sad. They've lost the ability to really engage their diaphragm. So every breath they take is like this. Imagine doing that 20,000 times a day. What's going to happen to your body? It's just like imagine walking 10,000 steps with a crappy ankle. How, how are you going to feel? How are your knees going to feel? How are your hips going to feel? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it's going to wreck your body. So yeah. breathing, we can last a, a few minutes without dying if we don't breathe. We need this constant energy and we need to get it in an efficient way. And that's what these breathing therapies and techniques and this retraining really does. Yeah, I, I mean... I've, I've found it amazing. Obviously, I mean, we could go on and on about what, what that's done. I'm really curious also on top of, of, of this, the meditative practice that you kind of went on and got on in order to, to get to here. How did we figure this out? And the ancients clearly knew something. Now, I mean, there are coaches, and as you've said, more in, in modern times. And I think you mentioned someone. I saw a, a conference or a lecture. Uh, John Mew, possibly? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there have been people and sporadic things, but I'm, I'm really curious also how we got to this point, uh, which you have touched on before, I think, uh, leading towards our diet, some of the things that we, we do nowadays that just have led to this general decline, though. Yes, you know, as, as a whole, you know, clearly there are people that, that understand this, but as a, as a whole, as a society, it seems as if we're kind of declining and losing this ability, which may have, I don't know, in, in the past, was it, was it natural? Was it natural for us to breathe through the nose? And what happened? Where, how we get Well, here? we didn't need to do any of this crap, you know, a few hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago or a hundred thousand years ago, just like we didn't need to have treadmills in our houses or, or weights in our houses, <laughs> or we didn't need to have a zillion different supplements or vitamins or powders to supplement our diets. Um, because we lived in an environment that gave all that stuff to us. We naturally walked our 10,000 steps a day. We naturally ate a whole bunch of different raw and whole foods that were good for us. We naturally breathed differently. And we know this from looking at skeletons. So what has happened in the last three to 400 years with the advent of industrialized foods, the human face has shrunk. It's gotten flatter and flatter and flatter and started growing backwards. It's gotten so flat and our mouths have gotten so small that teeth have nowhere else to grow. So they grow in crooked. So we're the only animal on the entire world in probably the history of life on this planet to have chronically crooked <laughs> teeth. And if you don't believe me, look at some ancient skulls. And guess, seems, guess what you're going to yeah. see? Yeah, that seems The crazy. most perfectly straight teeth these wide faces, and most importantly, they had these huge nasal apertures, huge sinuses, larger airways. So we can't go back in time and say, did they have emphysema and asthma and did they snore? And, but we can look at their skulls. And from looking at that, just looking at physics, the physics of that, they would have had significantly fewer chronic respiratory issues as, as we did. And so, you know, you think that humans, that all life is just getting better and stronger and fitter, complete garbage. You know, when we've got a population, 60% of the population now uh, overweight, 40% obese, 10% has diabetes. Uh, does this look like progress to me? Did, you know, so, so it's, it's learning this. And I learned this from biological anthropologists. It just blew my mind because I had been told in school 
evolution meant survival of the fittest, but, but it, you know, you can walk around any street and see that, you know, a few hundred years ago, I think we were a lot stronger than we are now. Well, then that touches on, you touched on something that I was actually going to, going to ask as well, because if this is where we're at now and you can see where we where we were, what does this mean future wise? Because it seems as if we are a, a society attached to our technology for good or bad, you know, whatever, you know, and are we going to get to a point where we're just going to enhance? It's just like, screw it. Like you can't really breathe properly. That's fine. Well, we've got this thing that can, you know, enhance your, your breath uh, and you, you won't need it. Or are we, where are we headed? Because if we, it seems as if we don't change, we're going to be either continually linked into Elon Musk's Neuralink to handle <laughs> the way we think and breathe and like, it's just going to handle our autonomous nervous system. So, I'm curious if you just have any, I mean, I get it. It's, it's pure speculation, but what do you think is going to happen to us if we don't do anything? Well, you know, the good thing about living in this day and age, which I'm actually really happy to be living in the modern world now because we have information, you know, we didn't know this. If I had known this stuff growing up, I had extractions, braces, wisdom teeth out, headgear. So much of this is preventable. So if my mom had known this and actually served me hard foods growing up and breastfed me longer, I mean, no no offense, mom. I know you did what you could, three kids, all that. But uh, I would have had a different face. And there's a very good chance I would have had straighter teeth and I would have had a larger airway, you know? And and so that that to me is what's, what's amazing. A lot of people think that all the problems we have are genetic. It's like, oh, you know, I inherited this. What can I do about it? It's genetic epigenetics the environment drives most of of how we are most how healthy we are even how we look especially when it comes to our skeleton skeleticure and our facial development so much of that is driven by epigenetics so if with this information now people have a choice it's like yeah you can feed kids gerber and soft foods and smoothies and all that or you can have them eat the foods that they ate for that humans ate for the, the last 2 million right. years. And you're going to have a different facial structure because all of that stress, right? You're going to build bones. You're going to build muscle. So it's an exciting time that to me that we have ways of getting information and fixing the problems we've had before. And we also have outlets like, like your show, like, like other podcasts where people can right. get this information. And uh, I definitely want to touch on the food aspect of things because just like the mouth uh, contraptions that we were using to, to run and the mask and stuff like that, the jaw thing, I'm not sure if you're aware of what's going on right now, but in TikTok, there's a very, there's some new fad craze going on right now with uh, some sort of jaw thing. And I actually, I continue to see this and I, I don't know if you've seen some of the new jaw clenching machine things they look kind of i mean you look weird it's like you got this ball in your mouth and you squeeze it and there's this one guy he's really famous on instagram just chewing away at it and uh i get it like that that's helpful but i'm sure probably yes like you're saying if we just eat the foods that would generally give us this and don't eat smoothies every day uh you'd probably be all right or we would be all right as a society but are those things cool? Have you seen those? Do you even know yeah, what you're referring so to? Yeah, so a lot of what we're developing right now, um, including what's happening in medicine, are just, it's just mimicking inputs that we would have gotten in a natural environment. So instead of actually chewing food, now we're putting rubber balls in our mouths to simulate chewing food. And why are these people doing this? Yeah. Because it gives them this sculpted face, right? These broad cheekbones and these, yeah. these hollow cheeks, wh which you see on models all the time. Um, that's cool. Right. That's fine. If, if, if people want to do that, they're free to do that. Yeah. But it's just so ironic that we're going so far out of our way and we're spending so much money to just mimic these other environmental inputs. Um, you know, if you don't want to chew for three hours a day, you can chew gum, really hard gum. That works. Um, but I just want to mention one okay. thing about, it's called um, Jawser Size. And there's another product where you're supposed to bite on it like this and you do this. I've talked to about a dozen dentists 
and they are predicting a, a mass epidemic of temporomandibular joint oh. issues because of this. If oh, you no. think about how you chew a carrot, imagine you're eating a carrot right now, right? You go from one side of the mouth right. to the other side, to the other side. You're not chewing it with your front teeth, yeah. right? Our faces, this is just to rip <laughs> yeah. stuff off. Yeah. So so our faces aren't designed yeah. for this. I'm not a dentist, but I've talked to a bunch of them and sure. they're just shaking their heads. Um, and, and they're looking forward to having these people as their, their new patients in a few years. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, it is funny to think that we're actually just mimicking and that's kind of the thing. But <clears throat> I have found that it seems overall in a lot of the things, and I'm a huge meditator. It's one of the, the things that I kind of, I, I picked up from my, my mom years ago. Um, and, uh, there's this, we have an, a, a, a tendency to break from nature and kind of ignore the, the cyclical patterns and the, the, the ease with which nature finds a way to do this. And in the fact that, like you're saying, no other animals got crooked teeth, like we should just look at what all what's going on here. There's enough. If we're the ones doing it, what are we doing wrong? And uh, so, I'm curious as well on two on two things. One, what's your what is your own uh, breathwork practice look like now after you've gone through all of this? Has it changed the way? I mean, clearly it's changed the way you look at at things and what you've what you've done based on what you've gone through. But do you have a regimen, a routine, something that you just like? I have to stick to this. I mean, given that you can do these things and go into the water, uh, you know, and hold your breath for an extended period of time, is there something that you do every day? Because you know, if I just continually do this for the next 40 years, it's just going to, I'm going to avoid so much. Yeah. So the first, the first part of that, you know, you think about um, uh, nasal breathing and other animals. So check out a cheetah stalking prey sometime. Check out a horse at a, at a full sprint. Are any of these animals breathing out of their mouth? They're breathing out of their noses. So, you know, we are designed to be breathing out of our noses as well. Yes, you can default to your mouth on occasion. You see dogs breathing out of their mouth. It's not for oxygen. It's to thermoregulate. That's the, they don't sweat. Thank God, that would be pretty gross, sweaty dogs. But uh, that's how they, they offload their, their heat, you know. So a lot of us though because of those anatomical changes that have occurred over the past few hundred years we have obstruction we have structural issues in our noses okay and in our mouths so even if we try and try and try to to nasal breathe all the time it's just for some of us it's just not going to work you have to get that fixed and it, it can be life changing for people but for most of us, this is a use it or lose it organ. It needs to be conditioned. It needs to be worked out, just like your diaphragm. We need to start focusing on our respiration, on how we get energy to the rest of our muscles and to our brain. And uh, there are no side effects to doing this. The only benefit, you know, the, the worst thing that, that will happen will, is that you're going to feel a lot better after each of these practices and your recovery times going to be cut a little bit, but I've seen people like transformed, like become complete monsters. They were doing everything else, right? They're eating, right? They're working out all the time. They weren't breathing, right? And, and if you don't breathe right, you're never going to be working out to your maximum potential. So as far as my breath work practice, uh, you know, every morning I put on a robe and uh, a bunch of jewels and crystals and I sit in it. No, I don't do any of that stuff. Uh, I'm a science journalist. <laughs> and so uh, you know, I'm not a breathing guru and I really try to stay out of that. I want to be just completely objective, go into the field, talk to the experts in the field, take all the data, crunch it and say, this is what has been proven to work. This is what's a little foggy right here. Here's what you should be doing. And here's the crazy stories of, of how all this stuff came to be, which to me is the most fascinating stuff. Um, just insane stories from from all over the world. People are coming to the same conclusions, even though they weren't talking to one another. So having said all that, yeah, I picked up some mm. some tricks along the way from you're talking to Wim Hof or, you know, a, a, an expert and you can't help being influenced and, and affected by these people who have transformed their health by breathing. So I'm aware of my breathing all the time, especially while while working out. I'm breathing through my nose almost all the time, even when I'm surfing, 
when when I'm swimming, I try to breathe through my nose. When I'm running, um, it and during the day, uh, I am conscious of the pattern in which I'm breathing. I'm not saying I'm the best breather in the world. I've got a lot of work to do. I'm structurally, I'm completely messed up. Broken the nose sure. three times, you know, small mouth, small airway, and all that. But a, wow. a great hack that people can try is called mm. sleep tape. So you can consciously control your breathing when you're awake, right? Guess what happens when you fall asleep? So about 60 to 70% of the population, (laughs) including athletes, skinny people, you know, muscle muscle bound dudes have sleep apnea and they snore and they sleep with an open mouth. This is bad news because if you're sleeping with an open mouth, you're exposing your body and your lungs to everything in your environment. If you're in a city like I am, that's dust, that's mold, that's pollution. So I use a little piece of tape about the size of a postage stamp here, and I put it at the center of my lips. And that's the technology. It's supposed to come right off. Wow. That's good. I don't want anything to hold my mouth closed. It comes right off. It's just to to guide you to keep your mouth shut at night. And I can't tell you how many people have written me, hundreds and hundreds of people have written who have just said, this has changed my life. Uh, some people say, I no longer snore or have some forms of mild sleep apnea by a little piece of tape. Again, doesn't work for everyone, not a blanket prescription, but what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, it's free, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Those types of little hacks, yeah, are right on par with the entire idea of obviously breathing just changing, changing your life. And I, after reading, I think I was somewhere in between. I had to go back because it was like, I had never paid true attention to, am I breathing through my nose or am I breathing through my mouth when I play? Because as I was reading the book, I couldn't really figure it out. I was had to, I had to think. So the next time I was at, at training, I kind of paid attention as much as I could and saw that I was somewhere in between. Uh, you know, I, I, I flirted with the line a little bit, you know, when it got a little bit too heavy and I had sprinted a bunch up and down and up and down and up and down. My mouth came came open and it was a little bit like that. And so I can happily say since then, um, I'm an, I'm a nose breather. Uh, and it was awkward at first. It was definitely awkward. It's more awkward. And I, other athletes will have to, maybe you've, you've heard from them, but after sprint, uh, when you sprint and you just put in that that really, you you immediately think about getting air in once you stop sprinting, especially if it's like a hundred yard sprint. And so it was really strange for me at first, going, you know. And I remember also thinking, uh, I, I extended that, and then when I got on the bike, because one of my favorite uh, techniques to to get leg endurance for for footballers is is the bike, is resistance training on on the bike. It's just it's brilliant. You can train like this and it truly just, you know, can take you to, to another level. But I was constantly breathing through my nose at that time, especially when I was really, you know, doing this, this, this type of training and it was awkward. And then now I don't think about it all. And I know along with the other things that I ramped up, thanks to the book and thanks to the information, and all the things that you found. My breath work is, and I, I know it sounds crazy to say, but it's, easily equal to a training. And I don't know how to explain that, but I know that I could probably do some intense breath work for, let's say, I mean, the longest I've probably ever done it just in a sitting meditative practice type of way is maybe 90 minutes. But I know that doing that extended over the course of, like you said, weeks or months even, it's equal to some training, uh, if not better, because you get more efficient as you go along. And then when you actually do run, it just seems like nothing. I, it's just the way it is. So <laughs> I, I found it, you know, one of the biggest and best things for a career that's gone on this long, you know, I can't remember very many things that I can say that have been revolutionary in that sense. And this will be the very first time that we've talked about this on the channel. And I've actually waited because I wanted to get more input from you <laughs> in order to back that up because it seems strange for this, this guy who's a soccer player trying to tell a whole bunch of people who are also trying to get better. Like, Hey guys, just breathe <laughs> correctly though. Breathe correctly. You know? So that's my well, hope. For, for know? training. It's, you know, you've already built up your muscles, right? You don't need to work those out every single day, 
What you do need to work out is, is how you're delivering energy to those muscles. So this breath work is a cardiovascular activity, right? It, it, an analogy is probably a lame one, but it's like a car. A car doesn't need to move its wheels all the time to be conditioned, but you, you should be lubing it up, changing the oil, making sure the timing's just right. Because if the timing's off, it's not going to be working as efficiently. And that's that's what breath training is doing. It's getting the timing right of your diaphragm to sync it in with your heart rate so that you're working at the state of coherence. And when things are working at a state of coherence, they're working at peak efficiency. And uh, I just want to be totally clear. I'm not saying never breathe out of your mouth. If you're about ready to, to score a goal right, and things right. are hairy and you're in overtime, <laughs> Do whatever the hell you need to do to, to get it done. Exactly. But I, I am saying, just as you mentioned, like sometimes you'll default to that. Totally fine. Bring it back. Why do you want to be expending energy when you're not in that all out mode? You know, um, and, and so that's what I think is so important is once you become conscious and aware of what breathing can do, of these different steps you can take, then you can use um, use it to help control the functions of your body and your energy levels throughout a game and throughout everything else. Yeah. And one thing I would definitely want to add with that, and I'm curious if you know anything about this, but I would feel, <clears throat> I feel as if my mental acuity, my sharpness increases tremendously after any of the practices that I do. And uh, I don't know if there've been any tests on that. Is that the case have you that's With, without okay. a doubt right now if you were to exhale to a count of about six inhale to a count of about six don't freak out if, if you're a second off or whatever this is just an exercise mm -hmm. inhale and exhale through your nose just by breathing that way you are creating more connections in your brain and we've seen this in numerous studies so you're able to better take control of your emotions and make logical decisions because you're connecting the prefrontal cortex with the hypothalamus and the amygdala. Okay, we know this. It's been measured. So the idea that people come out of breath work or come out of a workout when they're breathing through their nose, they're like, not only do I is my recovery time cut in half, and you can see this with heart rate variability, right? But you're clear of mind. And the reason is when we over breathe, when we breathe over our metabolic needs, we cause that constriction, right? And we, we cause a constriction of blood flow to the brain. It makes it harder for the brain to get blood. So if you go into extreme hyperventilation, blood flow to the brain can decrease by something like 30 or 40%. That's extreme hyperventilation, right? So you can take that in, in various gradations. If you're breathing more than you need to, you are hyperventilating, right? You're offloading that CO2. You're denying the brain it's proper blood flow. And, and so again, it's simple biology, but so few of us really recognize this or appreciate it because we assume that breathing more means more oxygen to the brain and body. Not the case as you have certainly found out for yourself. Totally, totally. Yeah. And it's, it's been, it's been incredible. And, uh, I'm a little curious as well, since you, you, you touched on it, you touched on it once before, but <clears throat> we, we didn't go deeper into it. You mentioned that our airways had shrunk or were shrinking because of the, the way that we're breathing or necessarily. And did you say that the nose, or maybe I saw this in another um, interview of, of yours, that the nose muscles deteriorate when we don't use them because it sounds so it sounds like that's not something that you really would have to work out i mean i get everything that's a muscle can be worked out that logically makes sense to me but it doesn't necessarily make sense that if i don't breathe all the time or that if i do breathe more through my nose is it my nose specifically that makes me my nose muscles that are making me uh uh, better or what, what is what is that what's happening there that actual mechanic of you know of changing the way that i i breathe through my nose what's going on there? so when i was down at i'm in san francisco so i'm pretty close to stanford university which has this incredible medical library i spent a long time there digging through the stacks but i also got to be friends with the chief of rhinology research this guy named dr jayakar nyak so he's like the top of the top 
He knows everything about the nose. And he has this office in this lab. He's the one that did the experiment, um, the, the 10 days nasal uh, breathing versus 10 days mouth breathing. We compared data sets. But in his, his lab, across from it, I was talking to a breathing therapist, a doctor of speech language pathology. And I was talking to her about mouth breathing. I said, I've been breathing through my mouth, like, I think my whole life, my face is messed up. You know, I was getting constant bronchitis and pneumonia, even though I was working out all the time, eating all the right stuff. And she's like, yeah, I was too. Um, and so she went into her files and looked at a bunch of people who had laryngectomies. This is a hole drilled in the throat, right? Because they had cancer or some other problem. Mm -hmm. And she found that between two months and two years, their noses were 100% clogged, 100%. The tissues closed in. So she's like, I think the nose is a use it or lose it organ. She herself was slated for surgery because she was a mouth breather. She's like, hmm, I'm going to just try to breathe through my nose all the time and see what happens. Her nose completely <laughs> opened up. So we have erectile tissue in our nostrils, right? It's the same erectile tissue as you know where, and it can engorge with blood and stuff up, or it can dilate and open up. So it needs to be conditioned. It needs to be used. And if you look at how many of us, especially in allergy season, are just like, oh, I can't, can't breathe through my nose. So the more you're breathing through the mouth, the more the body is going to adapt that and think that this is the normal way of breathing. And so all of these systems will start to shut down, which is why you need to train nasal breathing just as you would train anything else. I, I can't tell you what a difference it is to your body, um, nasal breathing versus mm -hmm. mouth breathing. Hopefully I told you a few factoids, but there are innumerable functions mm -hmm. that the nose serves in. And, uh, it, and especially for mm -hmm. athletic performance, man, it, it makes a huge difference. Oh, yeah. And the, that's another thing that I wanted to touch on, given for athletic performance. You, you talked about clearly there was the um, the exercise of putting water in your mouth and then maybe running 400 meters or however long the, the sprint the sprint is. But trying to take less breath, uh, less breath. I'm curious about that and how that actually gets incorporated into into training for people because it's kind of like do I and I think you 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 maybe touched on it in, in the book as well with cyclists possibly taking less breaths per time or how how could someone kind of regulate that because that to me is something that I haven't tried which sounds kind of cool to see if like oh can I do these fifth or two shuttle runs on one breath you know or two breaths you know, and then recovery time, like on two breaths or whatever. It's interval training, you know, it's like hit training, but, but for, for the cardiovascular system for, for breathing. So it, it's complicated. Uh, you need a coach. Uh, you can read books on it. Uh, Patrick McEwen, um, he works with so many top athletes, works with asthmatics. I mentioned him earlier. He has a 500 page book on how to do this with every possible lesson you, you need. I, I, it is hard um, without having someone there coaching you, uh, which is why I think breathing coaches are going to be the next big thing. I mean, it's, it's already happening. I'm hearing from these guys all over the place. They're now booked 18 months in advance um, for, for teams, okay. for rugby teams, for soccer teams, for football teams. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, the only thing I could say is, is, most of the practices revolve around the same theme. And the theme is to breathe normally and then to exhale and hold your breath and walk 10 steps. Breathe normally, exhale, hold your breath for 15 steps. Breathe normally. Don't push it. This isn't about like, you know, pushing it to the edge where you're about to pass out. Gently condition your body. And another thing these guys told me is they said they have their athletes work out to the level where they can breathe correctly. If at any time their breathing becomes dysfunctional, <laughs> dial it way back and, and only work out to where you're breathing correctly. And then once you build that base, you can push it and you can push it a little further and a little further. And that's how they're building just these monsters right now. Uh, people were, you know, cyclists are saying that they've, they're, they're skimming minutes off, off of their time. And, and runners have said the same thing. Um, NFL guys, I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. And, and again, it's not complicated. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's, of course, if you're getting air, 
the, your main source of energy more efficiently, you're going to run faster and harder for longer. Yeah. And that's so, uh, that's a really key point. And uh, it doesn't just pay, I mean, it, it's not just applicable to, to, to the breath, but what I've noticed as well, sure. When I was, you know, in my early twenties, the idea is, and I mean, all guys probably go through some form of this at all time. It's like, uh, if you, if you want to, you know, go to school, you think I'm going to read all the books or if you're going to be, uh, you're going to do some, if you're going to get jacked, you think, all right, I'm going to go lift a, a 150,000 pounds immediately. That's the thing that I do. That's how we get into it. But what I've noticed is if you can incrementally apply some of these things slowly and slowly, slowly, it seems at first, because we have all a tendency, we want to go from zero to a hundred. We want to go from fat to fit or, you know, from skinny to jacked in one second, but it doesn't happen one second. And it truly is pretty much applicable. I'm sure you've probably seen this as well to almost everything in your life. It, 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 you don't, you rarely do you go from uh, not an author to having a <laughs> well-selling, it just doesn't, it does not how it works. And so we have a tendency to do that. Um, and just anecdotally, really funny, one of the other guys uh, in our in our company who has not been playing lately, wanted to do a thousand push-up challenge. He has not been doing push-ups <laughs> for a very long time. And he's just gone back and he just he just had a, a kidney stone procedure and stuff that just was just an awful two month. It was an awful thing, you know. And he wanted to do a thousand push-ups in a in a week. Well I'm training right now and doing that. And when I heard it, I said, that's great. I'll do it with you. Not thinking he hasn't really been doing it. And so he didn't really get up. Obviously, yeah, he got real sore real quick and, and all like that. And that's what happened. So I would imagine that guys that are wanting to get into this and listening to this, it's totally, it's totally fine to just start with one small incremental change and go from there. Yeah. Right? And, you know, when you're young, you can get away with anything. You eat whatever. You got energy. When, you know, right. if you want to play a long game, you, you got to start taking care of stuff and being a little more reasonable with it. Um, there's this interesting study by this guy named George Dallum. I think he was a uh, ultra marathoner and also a researcher where he converted athletes to breathe uh, through their noses and then had a control group who was breathing through their mouths. And it took so long. And, and that's why so many people are turned off by this. People may be hearing this and they're going to go out and jog, try to breathe through their noses. They're going to say, this, this <laughs> sucks. This is terrible. I can't yeah. do this. And the next day they'll try it and there's, they're going to say, it still sucks. This can take weeks or even months. I mean, that that's what they're finding, months of acclimating. But once you get there, once you get get over that that hill, uh, you know, you're going to see some, some profound changes. There's a very good chance. And his runners uh, that he trained in nasal breathing, they were able, after six months, so, so it, he followed them the whole time. They were able to work out at the same level with 20% less respiration. So they were able to exert 20% less energy breathing and work out at the same level. So you could use that bonus 20% to guess what? Kick your competitor's butt. I mean, that that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, and and you know, also I just want to mention one other thing with, with the long game. You look at all these NF, not all these, a lot of NFL guys. Right, they're they're jacked up for a couple years. They're young. They're pushed to the brink. Right when they retire, they have metabolic syndrome, or they get diabetes, or they're completely sick. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. seem like a, a good plan. Or or you can look at Tom Brady. Right, dude's 42, 43, but he's right. very careful yeah. about his training. He he trains in a in a in a calm way. He builds his base. And he just won the freaking Super Bowl again. So, so take take your pick. Which path do you want to go down? <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough, uh, we've talked about this, or I don't actually. I'm not sure if we did talk about it on a podcast. I had a strange. I'm from Kansas City, so uh, I was obviously Sorry about that. <laughs> the Chiefs. It was rough. I know, I know. But uh, funny enough, I had a dream uh, two or three days, or maybe a week before. I think actually a week before the Super Bowl that uh, the score was thirty to seven, and I think it was it was actually very very close to to that and i just didn't want to believe that i just had a precognitive dream because it was just a, the dream was just one image of tom brady raising his hands happy in the score there and i was like when i woke up I was like, Shit, we're gonna lose well what's the you stock know? market gonna but, do uh, in in a month man if you're having those dreams send me a little I, test okay i know 
<laughs> that's what I'm trying. I actually, yeah, it's funny enough. Yeah, we had a dream uh, specialist, a guy who classifies himself as an Olympic dreamer on uh, because I've had a fascination with lucid dreaming and that's what he did. That Every day he treated it like a sport. And it's really funny uh, when you get athlete mentalities in uh, you know endeavors that aren't necessarily called athletics necessarily which is a dreaming like you think of what i just do this all the time i don't pay attention and it's it was fascinating to listen to this guy who goes to the gym you know in the daytime meditated thinks about his things thinks about how he's going to dream and then his game every night hmm. he set himself up he ate right he did all those things right and so yeah it was just uh, incredibly fascinating to see uh but anyway uh what are you working on now I'm out of curiosity. Uh, I'm still doing what's, the, what's still up? on the breath train here. Uh, it's been chugging along. So we're, we're releasing throughout Europe and, uh, you know, okay. I'd love to go out there and do a little book tour. I'd love to go anywhere than the downstairs in my house where, where I've been for nine right. months okay. in front of zoom. Um, but, uh, I have another book right. idea, but, but the thought of secluding myself okay. for, you know, another three, four years in, in a room doesn't sound too attractive. It, it might have been if, if the world was opened up, but I got to go hit the road. Uh, and so I'm going to be doing um, more events. Yeah. Um, I'm working uh, with the UN now to bring breathing awareness to developing nations uh, for kids um, wow. on, on a project for That's a global right. classroom, uh, which I'm really excited about because, again, You've got these people in these in these cities. There's pollution. They don't know how to breathe right. I'm not going to say this is going to like fix all their woes, but it can calm them down. It can make them a little healthier. It's free. It's available to everyone. So why not? I'd be remiss if I didn't ask now that you're bringing up that you're stuck in your house. The breath and COVID. What? Uh, I, I don't... Uh, what to think about that? I know, obviously, I know. Once again, you've done a great job of letting everybody know this is not going to solve everything, but there must be clear benefits, right, to having a proper, good, efficient breathwork practice, or possibly just breathing correctly. That's going to possibly offset something for what COVID is. And I mean, hopefully, the things are better. But well, what have you found? It's pretty interesting that we have a respiratory disease pandemic, right? It. The way it affects us is it infects our lungs and robs us of the most basic biological function. So we've done a good job on, in some places of, of shutting down, of quarantining, right? But I have heard nothing about, hey, maybe you shouldn't be driving down, you know, a bunch of McNuggets every day. Maybe you shouldn't be <laughs> drinking four exactly. liters of freaking exactly. Coke every day. Exactly. Uh, yes. Maybe you should be focusing on your breathing. Maybe you should be focusing on your mental health. I've heard nothing of that because the reason is there's no money in telling people to stop going down and, and getting a triple whopper, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. so I think it's, it's so ironic. If you want to help people, you know, will breath training, you know, allow you to not get COVID? No, nothing. Will it bolster your immune function and allow you to better defend your body against it? Of course it will. Just like eating well will, just like exercise right. will. So right. why aren't people talking about this? Uh, it is interesting. I keep talking about the nose, but I'm now going to bring on my, my guest. He's been waiting patiently. You know, there's, there's a yeah. reason why we have all of these different structures here. Because when we breathe air through our mm -hmm. nose, Guess what we do? We filter out all the crap, a lot of the crap in our environment, and we it helps our bodies kill off viruses. So just by breathing through the nose can decrease your viral load. And this is what Dr. Louis Ignaro, who won the Nobel Prize in the 90s, has been saying. Nasal breathing should absolutely be done when you have a mask on. So don't think you can default to, to mouth breathing and you're safe. Breathe through your nose. When you're walking around, when you're in public, breathe through your nose. And that's uh, spot on. I've, I've had tons of conversations why I didn't understand why preventative measures, when we were in the midst of this, wasn't being talked about. It seemed weird, almost conspiratorial, because it was like, what? we're all just supposed to sit here and panic? Or is there nothing I can do? Don't avoid, don't do this, just do that. It's like, well... There's got to be ways to to you know to push yourself to be healthier and and yeah I think it's poss it's possible yeah there's nothing 
there's no true gain in, in telling someone not to go have their Coke. And also it's our comfort levels. It's just, we like having our Coke. Yeah. I like my, my McDonald's. But are you going to be more, Don't are you going to be me. more comfortable in a gurney? Like completely wrecked? <laughs> or are you going to be more comfortable in your house? Like eating a salad? So, yeah. so this is the stuff I just yeah. find is insane yeah. is like, even our government can't tell us like, maybe this is a good time to take care of your health, to focus on your breathing, to try out meditation because you're in your house, you know, all these right. things that are free. <laughs> and instead we hear zero about it. And, you know, cause they're keeping America's fast food restaurants open for business. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you've got me on yeah, my yeah. soapbox now, but you're on the same soapbox. So, yeah. so good for you. I am. I am. Unfortunately, it just seems that it needs to be said. Someone's got to say that we need to step it up. It seems like we're too comfortable in that sense. But um, listen, awesome. It's been great. We'll, we'll, we'll kill it here. Tell us where <clears throat> they should go. I mean, a lot of people are going to have questions and they're going to want to check out. I mean, obviously, you guys can get the book on Amazon. We're going to link to everything. But what else did you want to kind of push guys? Towards? Yeah, you can check out my uh, website, not because I'm trying to sell you anything, because I have all 500 studies up there for free on the website. Anyone can look at them. There's some videos, there's some breathing techniques. Brian McKenzie, top elite athletic trainer is on there. I also have interviews with professors from Harvard and elsewhere talking about the importance of breathing. That's where you can hear this stuff about COVID how you can defend yourself against COVID. Again, it's, it's all free. It's out there. I'm trying to get better at social media. I'm an old dude. So this is just like a, a total brain funk for me to get my head around this. But I have an Instagram channel where I'm only doing stuff related to, to breathing and, and the science in and around that at Mr. That's Mr. James Nestor .com. Okay. All right. Well, guys, we will link to <clears throat> everything uh, that he just spoke about right here down below. So if you're watching this on YouTube, just check out the description box. If you're listening to the podcast, it is in the show notes. James, this was awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And I think everybody's going to have, uh, as a matter of fact, if you guys don't have something to take out of this, then listen to it again. Okay. <laughs> and figure it out because there's some good stuff in this podcast. I appreciate you awesome. being here, man. Thanks so much for having me. 